Okay, voice check. Hi. I try to walk all the time because I can. Top left. I'm not afraid of death. Overwhelming beauty. I can't remember where the hell it was. <laughs> Cut, edit. Bottom left. But anyway, it is what it is. I'm Mike, the Stormy Skies. How's the volume? You're a part of everything. Shadows. It just all takes time to, to sink in. Forever grateful. Blah, 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 blah. Kindness, family, love, non-judgment. This is casting, you know, that halo look around my head. My name is Mike, and I'm here to explain or share my story of uh, my dance with cancer. The amazing people that I met along the way, things that I've learned about the medical profession, about cancer, um, life, death, and all the amazing things in between, <laughs> all the positivity that surrounds the whole journey, if you will, the whole experience. You know, you're dealt some cards and you gotta make the best of it. And uh, you can't dwell on, on the past and uh, you learn what you learn and you carry on. So. But first, I want to thank my family, um, the incredible support, all the amazing meals that were cooked and brought up to me, and just the love that, that spread out from such a, a huge family. I'm, I'm so lucky, uh, on and on, and friends. This part was incredible. Anyway, to the medical profession. Wow, uh, my physiotherapist, the first emergency room doctor, the young, tenacious neurosurgeon, the incredible skill set of the surgeon that uh, performed his magic, the nurses and the caregivers in the uh, recovery, the oncologists at the uh, Saskatoon Cancer Center. The nurses on the sixth floor of RUH and the entire staff there. It's not, it's, you know, it goes beyond the nurses. There's all kinds of people assisting in that ward and uh, in helping, whether it's making sure that you can actually make it down to the room to have a shower and if you're safe while you're doing it. Uh, you know, it's, it's just a massive amount of teamwork and dedication that goes into it. You know, strangers that uh, offer their assistance to your family members and to you. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a whole village. It's, it's an entire village that yeah. supports you and your family. And I hope that supports the caregivers as well. Counselors at the uh, Cancer Center. The difference. Not a difference. The difference. Um, Colleen. You know, and the magic uh, that she performs through uh, uh, traumatic therapy counseling. And uh, the yoga program that she put on for cancer patients and their caregivers, which I was so fortunate to be a part of. And there's a few people along the way that came into my life that didn't make it. Young and old. Themselves and their family helped create the, the goalposts of how I monitor my life and how I go through my life after this experience. You know, there's, there's, there's beauty in the ugliest of truth. Sometimes it's hard to find it. But we never know what impact it has on an individual or individuals. There's this circle as it expands. So choose your actions wisely. <laughs> but always be yourself, always be you. If you, <laughs> you know, if you, if you meet people that uh, um, I guess if you're unfortunate enough to meet people in those kind of positions, uh, 
you can see the depth of character in, in humanity and the skill set and determination to not only look after the patient but also to assist the family member members and, and friends through this uh, this crazy, crazy experience. So this is, uh, you know, I, I, I guess a dedication and a, and a recognition to all those people with cancer. I uh, had non-Hodgkin's Burkitt's lymphoma. Um, it was situated in my central nervous system, in my spine. And prior to knowing that I had cancer and the surgery and all that, I had problems with my back and had been bothering me for a while. And I was seeing a uh, physiotherapist. So approximately two weeks before I had my surgery, I was seeing her and she uh, just very gently touched my back. I, it launched me onto the floor in tears. It was such an incredible instant amount of pain. You know, I remember walking around and gently touching my shoulders and trying to lift me back up and asking, what did I do? And uh, I know my response was, uh, you just can't touch my back there. So off I went for x-rays. In latter conversation, she didn't expect she'd see me again. But everything was, you know, good on the x-rays. There was nothing to see. Uh, I think like everybody else, they were looking for uh, some kind of problems with the, within the joints and the, in the, the, the bone structure or muscular. I'd seen her again, you know, I think it was the following week. I, you know, she asked how things went. You know, everything was good. She did give me this, this lecture that if this progresses, and starts to affect me in any way neurologically to get immediately to an emergency center. And of course, I didn't really fathom that. I didn't understand. I had my session with her and I went back home out to the, to the small farm that my sons and I and whole family kind of have. Things progressed rather quickly. I had been given medication from my GP who had lined up to see me, to send me to see a specialist. That was all in the works. The medication that I was given didn't even touch it. So I was taking, uh, eating copious amounts of uh, cannabis to thwart the pain. I couldn't lie down anymore, so I was sitting in the uh, reclining couch, sleeping, sitting up. I'd be awake for a half an hour, maybe every Five hours I would wake up and take more of the, the cannabis and go back to sleep again. It would, you know, knock me out. That was the only thing that would kill the pain, take the pain away. And it, it finally got to a point where my sons phoned their mother. She come and picked me up. I was to stay with her for a little bit. My son showed up. He was going to bring me to the city on, on Friday. And Thursday night I wound up sleeping, standing up, if you will, in uh, the washroom, peeing every few seconds and always felt like I had a full bladder and you know, I, things were going south in a hurry. So anyway, in the morning, we're off to the city. And on the way into the city, you know, I had not pull over on the side of the road where I evacuated my bowels, got back on the road and away we go. I wind up at my physiotherapist appointment because uh, one, I had been to the hospital, had my x-rays with no result, and I trusted her. I knew that she knew something was going on, and I felt that she was the one who could direct me. And that's exactly how it wound up. She came out to the waiting room, she seen me, both my son and I walked in, and the first thing she said to me is, what are you doing here? I told you that if this starts to affect you neurologically to get yourself to an emergency center right away. I said to my son, take him down to the emergency department at City Hospital. Right. She said, if you're extremely lucky, they will uh, load you into an ambulance and ship you to RUH. And then if you're really lucky, you'll be under the knife tonight. Get out of here. And away we yeah. went. Uh, that's exactly how it uh, played out. I 
went to St. Paul's or City Hospital, shipped up to um, RUH, where there was. <laughs> I just I have to giggle and kind of laugh. Uh, a young neurosurgeon who was like a tenacious pit bull. Once he got a hold of me, he wasn't letting go of me. Now we're in the hallway because the emergency unit is busy. Anyway, he latched on and got the ball rolling. You know, another great thing that happened was I wound up with uh, supposed to be one of the best neurosurgeons in the province doing his, his magic. It, with this young doctor assisting, uh, under the knife in an emergency surgery that very same night. You know, some of the, some of the funny things that I, that I do remember was the young doctor trying to uh, get me to lie down so I could get into the MRI machine, and uh, that wasn't happening. Then I tried to explain to him, I can't lie down. You're going to have to put me out if you want me to lie down and, and get into that machine. Before I went to sleep, they did inform me that if there was any surgery going to be required or any of that kind of thing, they would wake me up and inform me. At this time, my son become a man. Because I do remember saying, I'm sure that I can't consent to anything. You just sign whatever they need you to sign. You know, you wake up one day and you're a young man, you're not a kid, but you're, you're young, and all of a sudden, you know, you got your dad's life in your hands. Yeah, those are defining moments, I'm sure. Anyway, surgery was done, went off, um, had a uh, tumor removal, a uh, rather large tumor uh, removed from my spine and central nervous system as well as uh, spinal decompression, um, of which I think it was successful. The uh, surgeon. surgeon wasn't uh, quite so optimistic or happy with it, I should say. Uh, um, he didn't get all the tumor but he took as much as what he could. I found this part rather fascinating. As he was explaining it to me, there was a nerve that was nicked, there was a lot of damage to the spine uh, from the tumor, and they had to get in and scrape and dig and chew away. So basically what my understanding is, is that they take you know those little dinosaur pieces off your spine and they open those up, a window into your spine, so that they can get inside work on it and then your spine heals solid in that area because of course there's no more uh, joints in there uh, so I was pretty lucky and I think it was it was a it was a very good uh, outcome um, one you know I can control my bladder and uh, my bowels I'm alive and I can actually walk all those were questions as to what the outcome was going to be, because uh, there was no guarantees on any of it. Now he had to make the decision, as he explained to me. It was, it was anyway. Just one post surgery. I'm told this that at one point, uh, you know, my son looked at me and said, uh, "Why didn't we bring you into town a week earlier? Why didn't Why didn't we bring you in?" And uh, apparently, my response was, uh, "That's a really good question." But uh, from here on in, we're only going to speak of positivity. And we're only going to speak of positive things because that's the way to get through this. That's the way that it was done. Uh, now, I learned through my in-laws and their final days in this realm as they went through their cancer treatments, and particularly my father-in-law, the, the message I got from him was simply that I learned more about living through his dying than um, I think I've ever learned through anything. Uh, to be a part of that process, and time with him, to get to know him, to really understand him, to assist him at that time. You know, I, I say, why wait? until somebody's dying, Let, uh, let's do that while we're healthy and alive and, uh, you know, shed the, the veil of, uh, of embarrassment or um, internal judgment, um, you know, all those, 
those dark angels that wrap around our our mindset, the, the cloak of darkness and negativity. Powerful, powerful stuff that controls uh, how we act and how we interact and how we live our lives. Uh, you know, to get to know the parent, to get to know our children. And so I, that's how I looked at this. You know, when, when, when it all kind of settled down, I kind of sort of tried to live my life that way, but now more so than ever. You know, show, show people your character. Show them encouragement and positivity and love to carry forward in their own lives, free of judgment. You know, people are always looking for a reason. You know, oh, they have lung cancer. Oh, but they're a smoker. You know, they worked in a uranium mine. I don't know if there really is an answer, but, uh, you know, you know when, when people ask those questions or make those statements, it's, it's, as a person with cancer, it can be taken in a real negative <laughs> connotation. Like, it's kind of a kick in the balls. But I didn't really let it bother me because I just look at it as it was my turn. Right, uh, you know the the statistics on the amount of people who are going to wind up with cancer is staggering. You know, it was my turn, so it was my turn to teach, to show the people around me. I wanted them to learn how to live, to live to the fullest. All my siblings were a little bit fractured because I'm a free spirit and I'm an escaped Catholic and. You know, I'm outspoken and yada, yada, yada. No animosities. Freedom. True, pure freedom. I've, I've kind of always sailed my own ship. I had the greatest parents in the world. <laughs> you know, youngest of eight. They raised me well. Choices. Go to school or go to work. Um, I should explain, everybody around me knew I had cancer. Um, I knew I had cancer. But I didn't know. I'd been told I had cancer, but I didn't know I had cancer. And that there's, it's a very important distinction. I think it takes time. You know, there's lots of medication going on. There's lots of things happening, lots of moving parts. You know, you get out of bed one day and, and you have an emergency surgery on your spine. Like, I mean, that, that itself, to get your head wrapped around that, you know, it takes time to get caught up to it because things happen quick. And you, you, you take your life and you put it into strangers' hands. You know, we think we have control of our surroundings and of our, of our life, uh, you know, or, or some semblance of control. And when it comes down to it, eh, we're along for a really good ride. Yeah, we can direct that ride to a certain extent, but there comes a time when you turn the reins over. The wind takes you wherever it deems necessary. There's not a whole lot you can do about it. So it takes time to get, to get your mindset into this, but it's important to know. My family, my girlfriend, you know, everybody knew I had cancer, didn't know what kind of cancer. I'd been told I had cancer. I, I told myself I had cancer before the surgery, when I was still at the farm, uh, you know, going through the medication every four or five hours. I, I went inside and had a, had a, a view of my spine and, and uh, touched it, seen it, and knew that there was cancer in my spine. And the first thing that I said to it was that I loved it, but that it was bad for me and that it had to go, and it had to go soon. Still again, you know, all the missed opportunities, the missed signs to, uh, to seek help. I knew it. I told myself it. I seen it. I touched it. But I didn't know it. I didn't understand it. You know, I was questioned afterwards by a couple of people, why would you say that you loved it? And my only answer was, well, it was, it was a part of me. It wasn't a good part, but it was still part of me, part of my body. So, how could you really hate it? <laughs> you know, you knew you needed to get rid of it. I knew I needed to get rid of it. But it wasn't with, with malice, it wasn't with hate. 
So I'm being shuffled around. I'm, I'm in the movement now. Now everybody knows I have cancer but me. <laughs> and uh, I can walk. So, you know, stubborn me. I'm, I'm getting up and I'm walking. And I shouldn't be walking. But I'm walking and I'm proving to everybody that they can send me home. Catheter in place. I'm going home. Nobody wants me going home. Nobody wants to deal with the catheter. I mean, I live with my sons, but I'm, I'm bound and determined to go. And so anyway, I'm out walking. <laughs> Not that I'm strolling all over the place, but I can walk. I want to go home. And so they remove the catheter. That's not working. So it goes back in where the joke is. I bonded with a, uh, uh, a nurse uh, while he's trying to put this catheter back in. And it's not going well. And I do remember um, it hurts. It, it, it did hurt. Because uh, he couldn't get it in my bladder. Like it would he'd get the tube up there, but it wouldn't, you know, things had been so distorted physical change in my body after the surgery, you know, there was, there was um, a fair bit of neurological deficiencies. One being it, it feels like the, the right side of my, my abdomen has fallen out. That's the best way I can describe it. It's, you know, it's just kind of hanging there. There's no control over it. Lower right lung doesn't want to go along for the ride. Feet, forget it. Legs, right side of my body is lots of... Uh, constant reminders that it's part of me, uh, the things that you take for granted. Anyway, the cancer center knew, obviously, that I had cancer, and uh, the hospital is full, and uh, I can walk, and the catheter is back in, and they're going to teach everybody how to look after this, and uh, the cancer center swoops in, saying, no, um, you know, you can't go home, and uh, puts me into a, a ward that only they control, and that's the stem cell unit. The Taj Mahal of hospital wards. <laughs> of course, it has to be extremely clean. The air, et cetera, et cetera, is all filtered, special room, special area. Uh, big TV, your own bathroom, your own shower, bathtub. You know, it's at this point in time when, you know, this team of, of doctors come around. Specialized fields, uh, the counselor is there, radiologist is there, uh, two oncologists are there, there might even have been three. You know, I mean, you, you know, if any of them are watching, they, they might giggle at how things really were versus how I perceived them to have gone. Uh, and I throw that disclaimer out there and I should have done it the very first. You know, it's my perception of how things went. They read you the riot act. Uh, inform you of who they are, do the introductions, blah, 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 explain to you that, uh, that you have cancer, what type of cancer, um, that being, again, non-Hodgkin's Burkitt's lymphoma. They explain to you that it's uh, one of the most rapid forms of cancer that, uh, that we can get, but that it is curable. Um, and then they talk percentages, 70%. But that the treatment for it is equally as aggressive as what the cancer is in itself. And then it's going to be no easy path. Again, you have no idea <laughs> what you're signing up for. But the choices are simple. Uh, go home and get your affairs in order within a couple of weeks. Or take the treatment that we have today. And, uh, I quickly realized that you know, I was very fortunate in so many ways. One, I didn't have time to think about all this. Um, you know, some people get diagnosed with cancer and they have to wait a month to get in or three weeks to get in or whatever the time frame is. They've got to live with that and think about that. Me, it was boom. It was happening. It was on the go. So in some ways, that's, uh, that's a good thing. And I will say chemo, radiation, is not the cure. I'm grateful for it. We have it. I'm alive. But it is not the cure. And I don't want to get into politics about it. And as a lay person who still doesn't understand the whole dynamics of the multitudes of cancers that we have, if you can come up with a vaccine for 
for uh, COVID-19 in a matter of months. 40 years, 60 years, how long have we been researching this, uh, this cancer bug? Something's not right. Anyway, I uh, listened to the best of my ability. As they were leaving, I said, okay. I said, come back and see me tomorrow. I have four sons, I need to talk to them. Come back and see me tomorrow and I'll let you know what we decide. Uh, the big man stops and I will share his name because he is his name and his name is Awesome, Dr. Awesome. And he said, no, 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 you don't understand. You've got one hour to decide. We'll be back in one hour and I want you to choose well. There's life and death in a nutshell. Placed in your hands. Choose well. Well, I wasn't prepared to die yet. I'm not afraid of death. I faced it before. Uh, stared down the barrel. You know, the last time was with a wicked uh, uh, dose of malaria that damn near took me out. But uh, here I am. It's a whole other story, but it's kind of connected because my form of cancer has a direct correlation to malaria. Uh, I give you one hour to decide, right? So there's, there's kind of the. <laughs> how do you describe that? How do you, how do you go through the, uh, the process and the steps of that. I mean, we're all going to have to face it sooner or later in one form or another, possibly. Other people will maybe just uh, go to sleep and the light switch will be turned off. Uh, well, the decision was quite simple. <laughs> you know, I was going to take the treatment, so when they come back, that's, you know, what I said. Okay, we'll, we'll go along with the treatments. And uh, there was a brief conversation just to kind of clarify, if you will. I mean, some words that I say are, <laughs> are kind of funny because there is no clarity. You know, what was about to start to take place? So basically the deal that I come up with in my head, and uh, I think I expressed with Dr. Awesome, is that uh, the chemotherapy, while it could very well kill me, obviously was necessary, but uh, my function in it was to stay strong, fight, don't let the chemo kill me, and in the meantime, in between those two, uh, the chemo will take control of the cancer and eliminate the cancer, and I'll come out the other side. So my job was simple. He was going to do his thing. I was just going to stay strong and, and fight. And it's kind of a funny thing, because I don't think at any point in time did I ever think that I wasn't going to make it until later. It just never really entered my mind. I was, there was a task, I was given a task. You know, whether I was up for it or not is irrelevant, it was there. Uh, it was either that day or the very next day I had five procedures, you know, get the pick line put in, scans of your heart, and I'm not, I'm not really sure what all of them were. I do remember one of the nurses that came in and read my charts <laughs> that day or night asked, did you, did you have all these procedures done today? And I said, yep. It was kind of, whoa. Anyway, we're in a hurry. And the next day, I started chemo. So the pick line, it's, it's kind of interesting. So what that is, is they find a vein in your arm here. In fact, you can't see it, but I can. There's a mark right there, and it goes in directly into your heart so that uh, when they attach to it, two ports, when they attach to it, it goes straight into your heart, and uh, almost instantaneously, you taste everything that goes in. Be it the fluid or whatever it is that they use to flush that thing. Numerous types of chemo can all have a different taste. The, the ones I could best describe are copper. <laughs> I actually think at, at this particular point in time, or very shortly after that's when people started to come and see me. And during this time, 
I thought, you know, we don't live in the city. I mean, we live out in a small farm in rural Saskatchewan here. You know, they, they tell me it's going to be six months, so we need a place to live for six months because I'm going to be in and out of the hospital and I can't go home. So we need to rent a place. I said to my family, let's rent someplace up high. We've all seen the city from ground level or two stories up or three stories up. You know, maybe this is a once in a lifetime event and people are going to come. So let's give them all a different view of the city. Let's go up high and see what it's, see what it's all about. So I remember them going out trying to find a place to, to rent. I'm looking through the phone on Kijiji ads and come up with this, this one place, which I phoned and talked to the, to the fellow. He was just getting ready to leave for Hawaii. He was leaving the next day. And he had never rented his place before. We got it, it turns out, we were in the second highest building in Saskatoon, shorter by one foot, I believe. You know, beautiful view. I didn't get to see it very much, but uh, <laughs> anyway, it was all good. You know, it wasn't about me, it was about everybody else. But the city is quite fascinating from way up high. Man, there's a lot of trees here. Uh, I learned in Africa that if you, if you put things out there and just let them be, they'll come back, it'll come back, it'll, uh, it'll work. There was just another example. I mean, yeah, we're looking and things, but uh, so people start coming to see you, and uh, you're still not in it. <laughs> it's an awful lot to digest, and it's an awful lot to digest extremely fast. It's an awful lot to digest when you're whacked out on all kinds of painkillers and all kinds of shit. The lauded, yikes. There come a point in a time when uh, One of the young nurses up there, she knows who she is and, uh, and I remember her walking in and closing the door, coming over to me and saying, uh, I'm not leaving here until we have this conversation and I want you to explain to me what it is that you don't understand that you have cancer. You need to get in, engaged, you need to get in the game, and you need to start fighting. I'm not leaving. The response was, oh, no, 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 I know I've got cancer. Um, got a little heated, and I did a whole lot of listening. She did the right thing. I think she probably took some risks with the conversation that she had with me. I thought and I still think, you know, it took a lot of courage, a lot of experience, a lot of insight, a lot of care, a lot of love. You know, there's beauty in the truth, right? Even the ugliest of truth. Um, you know, I don't know where it would have wound up had that conversation not taken place. When she left, I was engaged, I was focused. Forever grateful. Some of the things that have to happen 
as your world goes from, you know, limitless to a complete focus. You have to focus on yourself. So everything, um, your priorities change. Yes, you, you still do the, the, the balancing act of being a parent, spreading love, optimism, positivity. But focus is really about, about you. And it's kind of hard to understand or explain, generally speaking, but I think probably what the one thing that people don't realize is that when you're told you have cancer, when that sinks in, part of it is the realization, the beginning of the realization, that your life is forever changed. Things that you firmly believed in will be questioned, they'll either become more solidified in the makeup of who you are, or they just go away. And it's just like, it separates the bullshit. <laughs> you know, all these things that we worry about, uh, um, you know, that we're programmed to worry about, you know, uh, our indebtedness to financial institutions. Ooh, you know, it means nothing. Kindness, family, love, non-judgment, you know, tear down the borders, tear down the walls. They're not those people over there being in a foreign country. They're just brothers and sisters on another side of the planet. We all bleed the same. We're all the same. And all this other stuff that we watch on the news or that our politicians or our religious leaders stuff down our throats 24-7, it's just crap. Like, it's just, it's absolutely meaningless. What replaces it is this uh, overwhelming beauty of what this planet and the inhabitants and nature fills us with. You know, uh, uh, freedom. You know, to be, to be part of the symbiotic relationship of nature with one another, you know, to, to not be controlled and to have no desire to control. You know, you, 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 just everything changes. <laughs> Conversation with one of my brothers uh, living out in Comox. I was on the phone at one time and I think this was kind of well into my treatments. And you know, he asked, he said, like, should I come out and see? And I said, no, 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 no. Wait till after. I'll get through all this and then you can come see me afterwards. And you know, it'll, it'll be a little bit more of a normal conversation. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, you know, I had to learn about boundaries. I never really kind of knew about boundaries. It was referred to as the B word. But it, you know, part of that, uh, my girlfriend at the time, you know, it was kind of a strange thing because I didn't want her to have to go through this. Her grandson was given a cancer-free diagnosis the day that I got my diagnosis that I had cancer. He was two at the time, two or three going strong, <laughs> little hurricane. And it just didn't seem right. So as much as I wanted to keep her in part of my life, 
I wanted her to go away. You know, it's not what people sign up for. You know, it was a relatively new relationship. So that plays into the mind. You know, you're, you're focusing on you. Like so much changes. You're focusing on your children. You, you know, you have to give, um, well, you don't have to, but positive encouragement to those that, that, that come and see you. You know, realistically, you know, of course, you have no freaking idea what you're going to go through, but you're going to do it and try to convey to them that, you know, I got this. <laughs> huh. Anyway, the dynamics are changing rapidly. I have a picture someplace uh, getting my hair cut. You're given, a, you know, again, choices, right? Choices are uh, always explained to me is, well, you can shave your head or uh, most people wait until they're picking their hair out of their food or get tired of waking up in the morning and there's hair all over the pillow and you got it in your mouth, and blah, blah, blah. So that happened, I think, once, maybe twice, you know, in my food. It was on my pillow the one day, kind of all over the place, and I thought, all right, that's it. It's got to come off. So there was a picture of Kelly shaving my head. And I did rock the ball. When a person is diagnosed with cancer, it takes time. I think it takes time for it to really fully sink in. And it, it, it lasts for years because part of the thing that changes is uh, you'll carry this with you forever. Depending on your experience, possibly with it. Some people sail through. But there is, you know, the, the, the question of, uh, well, you know, a person who's a smoker or this or that. It, it's, it's also, it's a defensive mechanism for the person asking. Because uh, it's kind of an invisible little creature. And yes, it can happen to you. You know, you, you're not supposed to be afraid of this. Don't be afraid of it. I'm not, uh, uh, you know, I'm not trying to fear monger here. I'm trying to educate so that if it happens to you or a loved one, to one, show you that it, it is curable. You can survive. But there's, you know, nobody escapes unscathed. Part of that is mentally for a while, definitely physically. You know, some people lose body parts for Pete's sakes. I mean, <laughs> come on, think of that. You know, got to make the best of the situation, right? Everybody's got to learn as you go. You know, find out the limitations. How else do you grow? You know, one of my brothers talked about um, a lack of understanding that he has on the courage that it takes surrender yourself to surgeries. I've had a couple. You know, I was trying to explain, well, it's, it's not it's not courage. You just, you know, you don't really have a whole lot of choice. So you just, you do what you got to do, right? And you sign yourself over and, uh, and trust. But at that particular point in time, even though I know I'm an experiment, I'm a guinea pig for the future generations and for doctors to learn, because that's what you sign up for, by the way. When it's your turn, those are all part of the part of the decisions that you, you maybe don't realize that you're making. Is you know they have, there's protocols, but there's also averages, right? And how everybody responds is very dependent on the per person. But there's averages. You know, you, you they, they come back, you give them the, your, your decision. I, for, I forgot about this part, and uh, I can still see the pacing, at the foot of my bed. You're not going to be doing this, you're not going to be doing that, you know, the, the do nots. This is why you're getting your treatment. There will be, you know, no particular type of mushroom and, you know, on and on and on and some really bizarre things. I said, uh, I have absolutely no problem with any of that, but I am going to take cannabis. I don't, I don't care what you say about it, I'm going to take cannabis. Nobody's going to tell me I can't. I had to tell them when I took it. So, you know, being kind of stubborn and whatnot, I thought, well, no, I'm not going to tell you. I'm just, you know, if you don't want to know, but we're getting to know each other, right? If you don't want to know, or if you don't really believe, I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell you. And so I didn't. It was the day I got my pick line out at 
the news that it, you know, was done. We were having a conversation about uh, g- getting off the drugs that I was on. This long list. And I wanted it off of them, and I wanted it off of them now. You know, there was some difficulty with that because some of them could get dropped off, but others, you know, it could take a long time to wind you down. And I said, okay. You know, they were talking like six months or more. And I said, no, you got a month. And uh, the question was, well, how do you plan on uh, dealing with the, the withdrawals? I said, I'm just going to increase my daily intake of cannabis, which is ingested. And the comment was, yeah, okay, yeah, that, that might work. You know, I, I'm kind of a believer in it all. So I said, I'm sorry, I didn't tell you when I was taking it. It was a little bit of a laugh. Um, as the comment was said, uh, don't worry. We knew when you were, when you didn't. We knew everything there was to know about you. The whole period of time that you were here, we knew exactly what was going on. So you think about that. And I don't doubt it, you know. These people have your life in their hands and they're, they're professionals and they care. You know, there's so much care given on that ward. It's a hell of a job. If you can just stop and imagine for a second what those people go through. You know, can, can you, you know, you know, again, you think of who we classify as heroes, you know. So yeah, they, they, they did know. But I mean, I should have cooperated more in that particular spot of it all, you know, because I, I, I do know that I was, you know, I'm a statistic, I'm a number. I'm also me. Anyway, so go back, yep. So on that note, there was uh, three times I stopped taking it during this whole process. Um, I think it was day three. I was violently ill. The good doctor had to come in. The conversation around me is that I was having an allergic reaction to one particular type of chemo. And I'm thinking, no, I started going downhill after I stopped taking my, my cannabis. And so I started taking my cannabis again. I know they gave me something to counteract the allergic reaction. And it was a day or so later. I'm back to functioning again. So did that have anything to do with not taking my cannabis? I'm not sure. So got to do it again, right? Got to find out. Day three, I'm sick. Start taking it. Things get fine. So that's 50-50. Still don't know, so we're going to do it one more time. I went to day two and started getting sick again and thought, no, I'm not, I'm not going through that again. And started taking it. Things went away. It... Uh, Gave me the ability to eat. Kind of one of those things, you know, when I say I lost time for the longest time afterwards, and I'm, I'm meaning like well over two years, I, I'd go to think of something or talk to somebody about something and it would be, oh, well, that was just, you know, like last year. But then there's this whole period of time, and I'm not talking six months, it's like, a year and a half, two years, it's kind of in, in, mixed up into a ball, um, you know, a time warp, if you will. And it took me a while to, to stop and think before I would make any comments like that or uh, even thinking of things, you know, in terms of, well, when was that? Well, when was that? Like it was. It was three years ago, or it was four years ago, or small side effect. So things are rolling along. I think I was out, and I was back, you know, for another round. Uh, different protocol. Some were easier than others. Uh, 
the one with the most amount of drugs and the longest or chemo and the uh, longest period of time it, I grew not to be too concerned about that one it was a shorter period of time with the lesser amount of chemo that was a tough one that one I had to put my socks on <laughs> and and get ready for it you know there's there's a nurse that sits with you starts your day and ends your day as they put this in uh, just to monitor you to make sure that you know your heart doesn't shut down with one particular type and on that short regimen the last day is 23 hours the last one is 23 hours it takes you a little bit to get over that one so they're not sending you home just yet <laughs> because you got a few days to to get wrapped around that lovely procedure. And then when they do send you home, you know, you have no white count. You're back and forth, in and out of emergency, or you're in for blood transfusions, or uh, platelets, or, you know, more blood. Yeah, the journey continues and the fight increases. You know, your stays at home become shorter because you're spending more time in the hospital. It becomes, you know, daunting. And it's not just it's not just the chemo, it's not just the doxy. How do I explain it? You're on 150 milligrams of fluid drip. You have a new girlfriend, by the way. She's your skinny girlfriend. This long, tall pole that's just filled with bags. She's a nice person, but she is a bag. Follows you everywhere you go, can't get you know, hooked up to your heart. She becomes part of you, an extension. You know, part of it is the steroids. Oof. Man, oh man. And you're peeing every hour, every hour. You monitor what you drink, you monitor what goes out, and when you do sleep, which is hour by hour. The nurses have two or three urinals set up beside you, you know, jugs. And when your feet hit the floor, you're peeing. Like it's instant, you know. By now the, the catheters come out. I think I had that for quite a while. You know, part of, part of the struggle is you can't feel, you know, most of your body, like half your body. Uh, you know, your, your abdomen is falling out, it's numb, it hurts. Your right leg is off on its own journey, your feet, you know, I still have yet to catch the guy who hits my big toes with that ball peen hammer before I open my eyes every morning. But one day I might get him. That he's not gonna be happy with what I do with that hammer. There's all those things you get used to. Uh, you know, your balance is off. You're, you're looking down to find your feet because, you know, there's no connection anymore between where your feet are and where you want to go. You're, you're having to kind of relearn that. And none of it is getting any better as time progresses, as your body starts to get uh, beat up. You know, the, 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 the lauded. <laughs> so, you know, the memory, the minds, the uh, what's real, what isn't real. You know, um, the disclaimer is always out there that, you know, I'm not sure. This is how I kind of remember things, this is how I perceive things, but I'm not saying that that's exactly how it was because I don't know. I, I do remember having a conversation, short conversation with a nurse once. She was in doing something. And uh, she said, are you hallucinating? I said, yep, I am. She said, ooh, that's not good. I said, oh no, it's okay, it's all good. There's white squirrels running everywhere. <laughs> They're all around here. In fact, they just ran across your shoes and up on the bed. And, uh, and I did make the comment. I said, ooh, no, that, that's okay. No, just leave me alone, it's all good. I said, I've taken mushrooms quite a few times and uh, there's nothing wrong with a hallucination. <laughs> of course, I'm thinking, like, 
fuck, look at the situation that I'm in here. Just let me go for <laughs> a trip. Let me escape this. It's, it's all good. But the weird part about that, the lauded, is that it was the same hallucination every single time. I talked to two other people afterwards and their hallucinations were exactly the same thing for them each time. It's wicked shit and I don't recommend it at all. Um, again, it does its job, but yeah, no, something's not right about it. But it's the steroids. Holy shit. Man, those things are wicked. I, I think I've pinpointed it to the steroids. You want to eat, you can't really eat. You want to run, you're not going anywhere. Your skin's crawling inside of you. Like you're just, you're wound up with energy that you can't expel. You're trapped inside yourself. And steroids play a key role or a role in the fight against cancer because they don't like steroids. So there's two kinds of steroids that they're giving you. So I always looked at it as a treatment. And I think I kind of wrapped my head around it this summer when I expressed that it's not a treatment. It was actually torture. It was torturous to go through. Between the pee, and it might sound silly, but between having to pee every hour, not being able to sleep for longer than an hour, and these frickin' steroids, and the doxy, and the poison that you're pumping into you. It's not easy. It's doable. That's the thing. It's doable, obviously. It's not for the faint of heart. It's well worth it. But it is torture. It's a form of torture. <laughs> One that I'm grateful for. I mean, it's all pretty freaking silly. Like, it's, you know. And I hate to use the word torture because, you know, it's could project a lot of fear and you shouldn't be afraid. You know, it's, it's about trust. And that takes an awful lot. I, you know, I guess some people are just a whole lot more trusting than others, but, uh, you know, it's all part of surrendering it, I guess. Yeah, yeah. You know, you have to trust in the system. You have to trust in, in the people that are treating you. Trust in the science. You know, I don't understand the science, but they did. So, you, you trust in it. And, you know, I had a job. I was assigned a job. I knew what I had to do. That's what I was going to do. And that's, you know, that's how it turned out. That's what I did. Messes with your mind. It, uh, it damages your mind. Uh, it's changing your entire life. Nothing is the same. There was a particular night. In fact, if I, if I want to put a time on it, I'll say it was 2, in, 2 a.m. I'm on all fours looking out over the Saskatchewan River, steam, lots of ice, and face into the pillow now, thinking, I can't do this. I can't keep up mentally. It's too much. I'm not giving up. I'm trying to find a way. So what I did is entrusted my body because I knew my body was strong enough to take whatever they were giving it. I knew they could, like, you know, I was an active, fairly fit guy. <laughs> I needed to separate my thoughts. I needed to separate my brain, if you will, from my body and trust and just let it go. And I did. I surrendered, which is also, I think, a key part. 
It's not acceptance. It's surrender. You surrender to the environment. You surrender to the treatment. You surrender to the situation. And you mentally take a step aside so that all the stuff that's going on, the fight is being held and being, being had. But you can kind of remove yourself. So you're more, you're more looking at it than being a part of it. So that kept me in the game. That's, I, I found a way to navigate this. I wasn't going to be the first one to sit down on this dance. Or as, as a friend of mine said the other day, you know, he said, he's a truck driver and he was talking about getting to the, to the uh, loading plot in the, in the bush to all load the logs out and the storm set in and people were going to go home empty. And he said, no, 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 no. We don't run a marathon to walk the last mile. It'll pass and we'll all go back to work. You know, drink your coffee, have a tea, have a sleep. And he's right, I mean, you, you, you don't run a marathon to walk the last mile. But on that note, I have seen people walk the last mile. And it's good, it's okay. It was a fellow that was in my room. Um, his son come to visit. He was an elderly gentleman. By the way, I'm 54, so there's, you know, a reference of young and <laughs> elderly. Anyway, he spent uh, two or three days with his dad. He was from out of town, another province. And the conversations were, were great. He talked to travel, talked of adventures, talked of their lives together, the, the, the places they'd been, the experiences they had, and how this coming summer, you know, the next summer, He'll be back on his feet, and they're going to continue to do the same things. And, you know, we should go here. We haven't been there. And uh, it was a great conversation for a couple of days. And then it was before noon. The son comes in and, you know, says he's got to go back home. And, yep, everything is fine, you know. Off to the airport he goes. Early afternoon, his team of doctors come in and uh, start telling him, you know, we need to do this and this and this. And, uh, he said, nope, nope, I'm, uh, I'm done. And that's okay. can't judge that because there does come a time and that was his time it was his call and it was right for him and he was done So as I could, I realized that, uh, you know, at nights I could go to the TV room where, you know, in my own head I would refer to as the newbies would come and, and wait their turn to get assigned a bed. What I wanted to do was try to, uh, I thought, well, maybe I could chat with them and alleviate some of the uh, concerns of what was lying ahead of them. It was one particular time uh, I was talking with this family and, uh, you know, trying to make, not light of it, but take the edge off the fear. I mean, the concern and, 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 and actual fear that's in people's eyes is real. Maybe it, it should be, but it's also something that you have to go through. I mean, you, you can't, can't run from it. You know, you can run from all your problems, but you can't run from your feet. This is, 
this is what's assigned to you, this is what's, what's part of your life, this is your challenge now. You can have fear, but have courage and have conviction to know that you're going to do your best. Anyway, some of the people I met in there, there was this one fella who was there by himself, he was coming in, and he talked about um, his life, his success in his life how he left home at 14 and went to work, bought some farmland and continued to farm, saved his money and worked and worked and worked and had all this financial success, become a big farmer and uh, you know, he had two daughters in their 40s, married, well established, you know, good lives, his wife had passed. And when he talked of, of you know, the hardships in, at the beginning and how hard he worked. It wasn't with a pride. It wasn't with justification of his wealth. There was an angst to it. And so when he talked, he also at the end spoke of how he lost so much time with his two daughters and with his kids, his grandkids. And money just wasn't worth it. It had no value. In fact, he looked at it as a, as a, as a you know, it, it robbed him of the importance in life. But when he talked of him and his wife and their winter travels throughout the world, he lit up like a Christmas tree. He was so excited to share the stories. And he just had a different vibe to him. And he was happy and he smiled. He was there to make a decision, and the decision was he could go home or he could try this. And he decided he was going to try this. But when he spoke of money, he, you know, he was he was mad at it. He was angry at it. So I wanted to point out to him that I said, you know, don't speak ill of of your wealth and your money. He said when. When you've told me your story, you light up when you talk of your travels and all the adventures that you and your wife went on, all the beautiful things you've seen, all the amazing people that you met, the life you had together. You just, you lit right up. So think of it this way. When it is your time to pass, all that hard work, all that sacrifice, everything that you put into it, can then be transferred over to your two daughters. And maybe they can have the same experience in life with their loved ones that you had with your wife. When he stopped crying, he gave me his phone number and he said, when you get out of here, give me a call. Well, the next day I went, I went looking for him and they told me that he went home. When I got out, I did phone, and it was no longer in service. Finding your peace, right? So, all you focused on your hard work, place your values where they should be. Think of the program, but I want to make this. I want to make this point because it's about humanity. You know, I always think of this particular doctor who was always um, with losing his mother to cancer. Anyway, he'd be uh, outside his mother's room. But I always thought, what a position. You're a man of science, you're a doctor. This is what you do. This is your expertise. And you can't help your mom. But the compassion that, that people have for other people and the care, the, 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 you know, real concern, 
the, uh, the drive, the desire to help people, to save lives, to better lives. You know, it's real. Think of life, think of values, the people you meet along the journey of life. Oh, wow. And the impact that they'll have on you, you never, you never know. People do the best that they can do. And they need to be kind to themselves if they feel that, you know, they could have done more or should have done more. Or, you know, it's just, there is no right or wrong. You know, all kinds of cliches, but it, you know, it's, it's, it's true. <laughs> there is no right or wrong. We just do the best that we can. I don't think anybody really goes through this on their own. We don't know how far out the tentacles reach and how they, how they touch different people. You know, friend or foe, relationships change. You know, everybody's got a role, everybody's got a function. You know, I think how it works is when you're assigned an oncologist, then the doors open up for all the different avenues of healthcare within the cancer center. Ask for one, if not for yourself, for your family. Uh, they're the professionals. They're the ones that can uh, ask you the right questions to get you thinking in the right direction. Not only that, they deal with government bodies. I think it's the, the second question that people ask when they're diagnosed with cancer. So what, what, what about money? <laughs> second or third, what about money? You know, come to the city here and pay rent for six months which then turns into 18 months. Even in Canada here, you know, our health care is covered through our taxation. If you're not living in the city, you're still a burden. <laughs> I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist. On that note, the lovely the, I would like to think that the first time she come to see me, I think and I want to believe I had this conversation was that I didn't need to see her then. I, I had this under control. But I would definitely see her at the end because I knew I was going to need her then. Because I knew nothing was going to be the same. And I needed help to piece this all back together again to move on. A crucial, key, functioning part of survival. Not a difference, the difference. Shortly after I was done my treatments, I was you know, back and forth to the cancer center seeing my counselor. And I was introduced to, to Colleen through her. And we were going to do a uh, traumatic therapy session. Now, if you're interested in, in that, just Google search uh, polar bear trauma therapy. And there's a, multiple videos that, different lengths of a polar bear that was uh, uh, tranquilized. And you, you, you watch and you listen how that bear come, went through it, resisted it, fought it, and then surrendered to it. It's quite fascinating. And my understanding is we used to be able to do the very same thing. Dogs shiver. Animals still do it in the wild. They have a... a, a, a you know, fight or flight system and they can they can deal with traumas and, and let it go. But, you know, we've been programmed out of that to, you know, suck it up, don't cry, toughen up, you know, take your lumps, all those kind of, you know, amazing teachings that we have for our children and for ourselves and for one another. So we've lost that over generations and over time. I, I refer to it as magic or voodoo, and it was a fascinating uh, experience. You know, it was, and I can't do it justice, but I'll, I'll attempt. So through conversation, I went inwards and found a spot on my body that didn't hurt and focus on that. And then we went walking through different parts, focused on one part, grasped it. Went for a little journey down the voice trail with it. And then I opened my eyes and I said a joke. I don't know what it was, but everybody laughed. The two of them laughed and so did I, because I think it was pretty funny. 
And that's all part of it. It was to touch it, deal with it, accept it, and then let it go. So through the humor, I let it go. I was trying to reconnect, you know, the brain and the body, trying to rebuild that trust. You know, I'm starting to build the trust. That weekend, I get sick. And Friday night, I started feeling really bad. And I was having a hard time breathing. And my lungs were on fire, et cetera, et cetera. And so I walked into the medic clinic and seen a doctor there who sent me for x-rays. And he said, if there's something wrong, or come back and see me afterwards. So I informed him I was going, I was going back home. <laughs> if there's something wrong, phone me. So anyway, a short while later, I get a phone call from him telling me that uh, I have to go back to the cancer center on Monday. But there's a mass uh, on my lung. I need to report to them and have them do all the new investigations, et cetera, et cetera. Well, there goes all that hard work of trying to reconnect the brain and the body because that trust is instantly broken and it's, oh shit, here we go again. How do you, do you tell anybody on and on and on and on? Monday I'm there, was uh, greeted by some people that were not very happy with the way that was handled. <laughs> More x-rays, on and on, no, there's no mass there, there's nothing there. And conversations were had about how to reach out to the gentleman who told me I had a mass. And I said, I'll deal with it, <laughs> you know, it's okay, like they can, but I will. I'll, f you know, figure it out and find a way. So. I think it was that Friday, I phoned and left a message for him and he called me back right away. I'd already determined that if he says that he didn't say that, I was just going to say, okay, no, it's all good. Um, I was wrong because, I mean, I could have very well been wrong, but I'd swear I wasn't. And that's kind of how it all come down. You know, I said, oh, okay, I must have misunderstood you. Sorry. And then there was a little pause. And he said, well, possibly I did. I might have. Anyway, <laughs> we had a great conversation, and I would be happy to have him look after me in the future. So I guess the moral of that story is when you're talking to somebody who's been through treatments, you got to be a little bit more sensitive. You know, it's the analogy that I read here a while back. The description was having a loaded gun pointed at the back of your head. You know, you can't see it, you know it's there. And you don't know if somebody's going to squeeze that trigger or not, and you got to live with that. Right? You gotta navigate through your, your life with that. So I know countless a number of people they get a sneeze or start to get sick. The first thought that they go to, you know, is 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 it back? Is this another form of cancer? Is my my cancer back? I mean living in remission is a challenge all in itself, right? May of twenty twenty two will be my five years in cancer free. So how to uh navigate those troubled times, difficult times, learning times, not troubled, just difficult. And it does get easier the further away you get. <laughs> so at the start my balance was shitty. You know, I didn't know where my feet were, couldn't feel my leg, couldn't feel half of my body, you know, bottom half, and the abdomen down. And I fell down fair bit. That was more of a light switch thing. Uh, you know, I could be standing there and my knees were always kind of buckling and somebody could flip that light switch off in my back and down I'd go. And then flip the light switch back on and up I get. <laughs> kind of a funny thing. I remember falling down in, uh, in front of a young uh, lady at uh, the eyeglass department in Costco. I was standing there. I think she was cleaning my glasses or something. And, it was a woman a little bit older than me off to the side and boom, down I go. You know, the, the woman behind the counter, she laughed. <laughs> but of course, it's a nervous reaction. Well, before I'm even up off the floor, I already feel sorry for her because, you know, 
not something that you would normally laugh at. I don't think it might have been funny. It probably was funnier than hell. But anyway, I got back up and I, I started, uh, I coined a phrase whenever I could see people uncomfortable. I would simply remind them that they should see me on the dance floor. My oncologist asked me how I get along in public. And, uh, I'd say, well, you know, people probably just think I'm drunk. And, you know me, I don't really give a shit what people think of me. You know, but it is difficult. I can make light of it, but it is difficult when you start to see yourself through other people's eyes as a person with disabilities. You don't sign up for that at the beginning. <laughs> so it takes some adjustment, and it's not an easy adjustment. It's part of the acceptance of the fallout Again, nobody escapes unscathed in some way, shape, or form. So you try to make people comfortable around you. But it's kind of, you know, I've often thought, well, why do you do that? Is that just to make the whole, I guess, just to let them know that you're all right? Like, I don't want that uncomfortness, that ill ease. And I, you know, I mean, where's the joy in that? So through this yoga program, it was a safe place. You know, we, uh, cancer patients and their caregivers, were the ones in, in the garden, groups of 10 people. We all had one thing in common, uh, and that was cancer, at various stages of it. I think most of us had been through our treatment, but it was a place of peace, it was a place of trust. Nobody was, poking us, nobody was putting things into us. There was no expectation, there was no judgment. We were all there trying to find the same thing. Peace of mind. Shit gets real on the mat. You let it out. It bears uh, all your secrets, flushes it with the right person guiding, the right environment, the, the right training, you know, it was, uh, it was a thing of beauty. You know, and I mean, Colleen did a phenomenal job. I mean, just her presence and, and the calmness, and I mean, that's a skill set. That's, a, it's, you know, it's something that just can't be taught and I'm not just the only one saying that. I mean, there was numerous people throughout the year that would share the very same sentiment and that have. One of the things that I discovered, and I say this tongue in cheek, is that men don't get cancer. You know, in the, in the transitions group that I was part of, I think it was myself and 12 women. Uh, hello? In the yoga program, each session, I think there was one male, aside from me. And they all got something out of it, in fact. You know, so I've been told, uh, you know, men were, were tough, right? You know, don't cry, don't show your emotions, suck it up and carry on. Get back to the grind. Get back to work as quick as you can and all this will be behind you. And plenty do. But from what I understand, two years, a year, three years, they're all knocking on a door looking for some guidance because nothing fits. Things don't fit anymore. You know, and this, this transition time is tough. Um, it's tough on everybody, be it, you know, your, your, your children. Uh, the expectation is everybody's good now. They're, you know, dad, mom, they're all, you know, they're through. Whoop, boom, we can stop worrying about that and carry on. But the person that's been through it is not done yet. <laughs> the physical treatments might be over, but what's left behind, you know, picking up the pieces. It's, uh, you know, in Ghana they have a saying that um, if you dwell in the past, you'll be thinking of the past as you walk through life. And as you're dwelling on it and thinking of it, you're digging a hole. And eventually that hole will become so big that you will fall in it. And that hole is your grave. And your life will have passed you by. Good advice. Now find 
the path to be able to reflect and bounce on it as part of the goalposts going forward. How you want to navigate the new you, the new physical you, the new mind, body, and spirit as it comes out from all the poisons and all the wonderful stuff that been pumped into your heart and through your veins, into your brain. But it's all good because life is beautiful. Nothing but love. You just have to get your head wrapped around how to deal with all the, the magnificence of it. Sometimes it becomes overwhelming. It's powerful, powerful stuff. When you drive through the prairies here and you see a sunrise or a sunset, more sunsets, I have a hard time with mornings. <laughs> it takes me a lot to get, get going, but I do do it once in a while. The sunsets can take your breath away. The hills, the valleys, the fields, the changing landscape. It's incredible. You know, I can catch myself riding down the road and I'm in tears. <laughs> and I'm thinking like, what? What the hell? Like what? Just drink it. Just let it in. Let it flow through you. Don't, don't try to stop it. But uh, I don't know. I would walk lines and the turn the taps on stages. somehow. You know, not fire first. Round block maybe. And then the rest of my day would be spent sleeping. And that went on for months, months and months. I'm now used to the elephant that stands on my back 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Some days it's just a baby elephant, other days it's a giant elephant, <laughs> you know. My feet, yep, I've made friends with them again. Still don't really know where they are, but they don't have to look down so much. You know, we can focus that gun behind our heads and think about cancer all the time or not, like try not to do that because it's the bus that can get you. It's the half the Ford F-150 going through the intersection that uh, you didn't see coming. So this, through this transition, you know, I, got, I get to be part of a conversation of you know, all of us around the table and to see what the community did in terms of uh, um, support conversations of within their own lives and how their loved ones and the people in, in their lives uh, were responding. And it's called being on the bus and off the bus. The person with cancer is driving that bus and that bus door opens and it closes. So you can be on the bus for a while and you can get kicked off the bus and the door is closed, but you can be back on the bus later. And basically what that means is if you have expectations that you're placing on somebody that's going through their treatment, be it radiation or chemo, whatever it may be, surgery, those expectations don't belong there anymore. That particular person has to focus on themselves. Uh, your role, whatever it was in the past, has now changed and you're the sport person. So get on the bus or get off the bus, you can come on later, but don't interfere with the bus driver. And you know, a lot of it, people do unwittingly you know there's no there's no manual <laughs> and again everybody's journey is different everybody's uh, make it. a lot of relationships I mean don't make it uh, and that's all right too times get tough times get really tough you know even in even in the remission part I mean you, you stop and you think about that here's a person you know that's gone through whatever they've gone through and they're struggling with trying to understand and find out who they are again you know there's gonna be physical discrepancies, if you will, there's going to be physical problems, there's, there's going to be uh, mental problems. If nothing else, there's going to be fatigue, right? There's, it's like using the word survivor. Some people hate the word survivor. You know, I've had it, uh, and I, I pause and I always question, you know, well, how do you verbalize it? What do you say? You know, one person said, how can you call it surviving? Look at how things are now. Nobody survived. <laughs> and I think what she was trying to say is, you know, there's a change, right? So, did you survive the physical treatments? Is that, is that what surviving is? You know, you know, and I think a lot of people struggle to get back to the normal. 
And I think for a lot of people, the realization that that's not going to happen. <laughs> that, you know, it's like COVID-19, we all want to go back to the way things were, we want to be normal. Well, things have changed, and it doesn't mean that they're not going to be better. In fact, I think they will be better. You know, we're all in the same boat. Yeah, we're sitting at different decks, <laughs> but we're all in the same boat. Hopefully there's a little bit more kindness, and a little more understanding, and a little more empathy, and uh, a hand to reach up. So through the yoga program, there was one person that'll stand out uh, who uh, I think will be okay. But it was, you know, it's his time and a place for everything. There's a time and a place, and you can't rush it. If you're not ready, it's not going to happen. And she wouldn't accept that it happened to her. It wasn't supposed to happen to her. She didn't deserve to have it happen. On and on and on and on. I hope she made peace with that. But there's an awareness of it, right? You get, you, you know, it's uh, it's the things that the people don't talk about. And I'm kind of breaking all the rules, maybe. Maybe I'm breaking all the rules. <laughs> you know, rules. Because I can tell you that when you go through your treatment, and this is an important thing, one, they don't really know, right? There's stats, there's averages, there's the individual situation of which they monitor totally. But you're also given information as is needed to be given to you, right? So. You know, I, I'm definitely breaking the, the rules there, and I apologize for that, maybe. Because this is sort of the big picture, where when you're in it, you need to focus on the small picture. And the small picture is today. Right, Dr. Awesome? It's just the day. It's just one day. And that's how you get through it. One day at a time. It's all we have. We just have the moments. We don't have tomorrows. You know, the opportunities for growth are endless. You know, that's, I guess, what a person has to seek or not have to. You don't have to do anything. That's what, what, what I choose. And I guess that's part of why I'm doing what I'm doing right now. Uh, I want to share this to help the next person navigate their journey. It's not easy. If you are diagnosed with my form of cancer at the stage that my cancer was at, Shit. you're in for a fight, but you can do it. And no matter how you come out the other side, uh, it's going to be good because uh, you'll make it good. You're not, you're not going to do the dance to come out the other side and go, what? You know, don't be bitter. I think you, I think you're just naturally going to celebrate uh, the joy that's that's around. So uh, I hope you can learn something from this. Uh, you know, there's there's people that are involved. There's people that you're not going to, you, know, you know, you might not ever see again, but they're going to impact you, and you're going to impact them. Be kind. A friend of mine and uh, uh, shares the same oncologist as what I do, and there was a little bit of. Um, communicative problems there. So your soul goal, um, he was getting close to another appointment. We had a conversation about answers, you know, he, he wasn't very happy. I said, listen, I said, you know, first of all, how would you like to be him? How would you like to sign up for that job? And stop and think about it. You tell people, you know, life expectancies. You see people die every other day, or every day. You see people go through all kinds of things, and you don't have the answers, because it's not an exact science. So the answers that you seek, that person can't give you. And what a, what a job. They can only, you know, they, they, they have limitations as well. But first, we have to look at them as a human. And they can't appease us. I had a list of questions that I wanted to ask shortly after my treatments. And so I made this list ahead of time. Gave it to the counselor to give it to the doctor. But the next appointment time, the counselor was sitting behind me. And now it's time to ask the questions. And you know, they're 
finger pointed questions such as through your eyes how does my life look you know in in terms of <laughs> you know life expectancy uh, um, that type of thing and and he's hemming and hawing and he's looking past me I quickly turned around and um, she was sitting there going like this and I looked and I smiled and I turned around and I looked at him and I said okay you don't have to sugarcoat anything I've contemplated life I've contemplated death countless hours of it. I've had that pick line into my heart while I watch chemo go in that could stop my heart instantaneously. You know, um, I've, been, I've been through the gamut. So let's just keep it real. And I know you don't have the exact answers, but I know my life expectancy has changed. I know that my heart, you know, isn't the same or my kidneys, or my liver, because there's big concerns about kidneys. You know, at that point, it's not so hard to hear. <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> if you haven't caught on by then, but you know, it's just, it's one of those, those moments where, uh, where there's conversations where, you know, it's, it's people. So I took that experience and laid it on the table with him. Like, you know, when, before we start getting critical and, and uh, um, wanting the satisfaction of our own questions, of our own concerns, and our own uncertainties, you know, through others, they can't give it to you. <laughs> you know, now, in some cases they can. But just take your conversation and, and you know what you want to ask. Know why you want to ask it. But also ask it in kindness with understanding of what your expectations are from that person that you're talking to. What it's like for them. When they say that they don't really know, it's that they don't really know. <laughs> they don't know. So don't, uh, don't use that as a wedge. They're not going to sugarcoat it. And they're not going to lie to you, but you need to trust. And if you don't trust, then find somebody that you can. You know, before you make that decision to find somebody else, you need to take a long, hard look in the mirror at your, your own self, though, and determine uh, what's best for you and, and you know, your, your responsibility in that, in that lack of trust, you know, accountabilities. I do have to say that uh, it was before the, my pick line was taken out and I wasn't sure if I had to go back for one more round. It was on a Monday morning I woke up in the apartment, soaked in sweat, looking at the ceiling, unable to move, and contemplating the next step. And that was the first time, the moment of truth, I was done. I knew then that I would not make it another round. I was physically incapable. And I had to have that conversation with myself. What do I do? Do I tell my sons? And the answer was, no. I'm gonna go back in. And I'm gonna fight the last fight. I'm gonna go down swinging to prove, <laughs> you know, that you don't give up that I wasn't gonna give up. You know, I signed up for the marathon, I was gonna run right to the end, right till it took me out. That's what I signed up for, be it right or wrong. You know, it wasn't ego driven, um, I don't know what it was. But I'll tell you, there wasn't a whole lot of peace because I didn't want to miss out with my kids. I didn't want to have to give them that life experience uh, 
losing their dad when they're relatively young, some pretty young. <laughs> and you know, I didn't have to do it. So that's as far as it took me. The nurse walking down the hallway, waving her marching orders to remove my pick line. It was the end of the battle. Round one, hopefully all the rounds are done. Excited and happy. <laughs> it was with Jess that was sitting there in the phlebotomy department and there's two nurses there and one nurse working on my arm and I didn't really want to look because, you know, stitches were coming out and stuff. <laughs> Not that I'm a wimp. But I was jokingly saying, you know, so with, am I going to be the only one who has a pick line removed that starts to cry because of all the pain and, and uh, the suffering that it's going to be going through? And I'm looking at these other two nurses and they're making jokes about it. And the one that's doing it, uh, she clears her throat and says, <clears throat> and I turn and look and she's got it. <laughs> holding it up. That was the end of that. Finished. Yeah. Uh, we beat it. We won it. We won that round. Uh, and like I said, maybe there'll never be another one. Would I do it again? In a heartbeat. Uh, do I want to do it again? Not a chance. Am I grateful for the numerous people who have contributed to this success? The counselor, Renee, or Lady Da, um, thank you. Dr. Walid Sabri, in charge of the team. Dr. Awesome. Beyond words. The people who donate blood that you'll never know, you'll never see. You know, you're all a part of it. Uh, a huge part of it. <laughs> you know, to the kitchen staff my personal kitchen staff, <laughs> and most certainly not last, <laughs> but the one who got me engaged in the battle. I don't know your last name. <laughs> don't need to. Regan. Thanks. Of course, Gabriel. So live in the moment. Live in the beauty. Turn the news off. Most of your social medias. <laughs> Start having meals again. Um, conversations. Shovel your neighbor's sidewalk. Open doors for people. And smile. Life is beautiful. <laughs> no matter how ugly the truth is. There is beauty there. There is positivity. Uh, there is life. Real life. Beautiful life. Thank you all who have been a part of my life at various stages. The good, the bad, the ugly and the indifferent. Thank you all. Take care of each other and, uh, you know, John Lennon, imagine. Well, it was like a dance. You call it the, your dance with cancer. Where'd you come up with that? <laughs> well, so my dance with cancer, uh, part of the deficiencies that I have is I have this light switch in, in my back that keeps my knees from coming and going, coming and going, and 
my balance isn't all that great, especially when I'm tired. You know, it started, it was terrible, but, um, or because it makes people uncomfortable. You know, are you okay? Can I help you? Or if somebody, you know, days I, that I used to fall down and then people get really concerned. And so to bring comfort to them, I would say, you should see me on the dance floor. One of my friends, when I was talking about it, suggested, well, it's your happy dance with cancer. And I'm happy that I'm alive and I'm happy to be dancing. And so it kind of fit and I thought, yeah, this is my dance with cancer. So everything that I talk about, I have to put that disclaimer out there that maybe that wasn't the way it was because I really don't know. But yet there's certain things that I think were just absolutely crystal clear. But even at the same time, there's so much that I don't know that I even question, is that really there? So, you know, that's why I think it, it would be funny for one of the health support team to actually watch this video and go, what, what, what's he talking about? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. So in June, you went in for potentially your last check. So I had an appointment with Dr. Sabri for uh, the end of June, which would mark the five years of the end of my treatment there. And I was waiting and uh, you know, I was watching this young man um, getting his blood work done. And, and I recognized that he had his pick line still in. He come over and sat beside me. And I uh, mentioned to him that when I first started coming here, this place was packed. His, his answer to me was he wouldn't know because this was his very first follow-up appointment. He was, we chatted and I told him that this could potentially be my last appointment. After. His eyes got really big and he just kind of looked, he looked a little shell-shocked, like a little in disbelief, honestly. And I hope it gave him encouragement to see his own way through, to think that can actually navigate this and that people do come out the other side and you know I mean I look fine <laughs> so you know I think how Dr. Sabri told me about it was that um, you know, my blood had been stable for the last couple of years and that he was going to discharge me from the care of the cancer center as I was treated you know, so, so these, are, these are some of your charts yeah you can understand them well, it's still hard for me to understand. So there's two regimens. And so each round is considered 28 days. And in that 28 days, um, you know, one of them was uh, 12 days of chemo. <laughs> I think it was 12. Uh, in numerous kinds. And the other one was eight days. We went through that. Because it wasn't a half an hour like... No, 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 not at all. Uh, it would uh, start generally in the mornings at 10 o'clock and between 11 and 12 o'clock at night. And every other day, Dr. Osman would come in and take a spinal fluid out of my spine to send off to the lab for testing and then inject chemotherapy back in with the same volumes that came out, right? That was always fun. And on that short period, that's the one that I grew to be weary of. That was, that was the kick, that was a hard one. That was the same sort of thing. Started at 10 in the morning, except for the last day. The last day on that one was 23 hours. And that one will kick your ass. When you're in the midst of it, or just when after the surgery, you met some people. When I was in the cancer ward, got the privilege of meeting a young lady. Her name was Nina and uh, her family. An amazing family, absolutely. I did get to go to her celebration of life. So Frank and I were uh, roommates in the wee hours of the morning. There was a gentleman sitting with him and got to share in his final moments and uh, the peace of it all. I mean, I've seen death before. You know, in my time in Ghana, I 
had to carry a six-year-old girl back to her family that had died from malaria. Present her back to the family, and that's, you know, the fragility of life. I don't know, how do you focus? Well, I think it just naturally takes you there. And I know you, you, you focus, focus. You focus on your family. Yep. Your sons. Yep. Well, that's all the important things in life, right? Sons and family and everything else. Pales. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I didn't want the experience to be wasted on anybody. I didn't want anybody being overly concerned. Um, you know, I'm not, I don't have any control of that, but myself. And in the process, you got a tattoo on your back. Yeah, exactly. I always wanted a tattoo. I always <laughs> wanted a tattoo. <laughs> and uh, mine is in a bunch of stitches. And it actually reads freedom. Huh. Why did you make the video? For a few reasons. One was to encourage people that are diagnosed with cancer. You know, that they can overcome this. That it's not easy. And that at the end of the day, and I think it doesn't matter how it turns out, at the end of the day, there's nothing but beauty. Part of the reason why I did it was to uh, give recognition to the uh, fam to my family and to the uh, healthcare providers on the ground and their backup support teams. And one of my concerns was that I would forget some of the things that I learned. And I didn't want to lose sight of those. Those were too important. I didn't want to get wrap back up into the program society that we have today. It was my privilege to be able to see the story nine once, <laughs> nine <laughs> twice, uh, so many times yeah. that I could, I know word for word what's coming, what's, what's not coming. I guess that's, uh, so I get to, I get to live and breathe. How many times you read a book once in a life? So I've read your book of that period. Yeah. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times. Mm -hmm. uh, of the five. six hours of it. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Cut out the half an hour of the hums oh, and right. the odds. So five and a half hours. Yeah, five Plus and a half hours. Plus what we're doing here, so <laughs> six right. hours. So, you know, and it's, it's our, it bore fruit, it bears fruit in my life. Right. And um, it's going to bear fruit in other people's lives again. You know, to encourage them. Mm -hmm. Stay strong. Yeah. Remember, tears is strength. Men, mm. Mm. Men, yeah. men, remember that. <laughs> you can cry. Yeah. <laughs> That's important. Yeah. And I mean, I'm lucky. Everybody, you know, nobody gets out unscathed. Mm. I have all my body parts, you know, for the most part, my functions. <laughs> so I'm pretty darn lucky. And I'm very grateful. And they can do it. They too can do it. Yes, I said I. Say the
that one should settle down. But those words just follow me around. Could it be the whisper in the dark? Your voice that stirs my heart and sends me drifting. Yes, I said I.